Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. Since there's a whole bunch of Suicide Squad stuff that's been happening lately, I thought it was time for a bonus video. You know, I think one thing is clear, you know, based on all the stuff that's coming from the set, the people making this movie do not care how much we know about it going into it. Batman was just seen recently on set chasing the Joker around. And, and when I say Batman, I mean a person in a Batman costume, not Ben Affleck. He wasn't seen on set. It gives you the feeling that the story might be going to like an assault on Arkham place. Especially because of some of the images we saw of Will Smith as Deadshot with Harley Quinn on the set. Really what I think is going on is that they're just blending a lot of elements from some really popular Suicide Squad stories. Batman Assault on Arkham being one of them. But you know I think that they're weaving a lot of classic John Ostrander in there too. David Ayer's calling it the Dirty Dozen of the DC Universe. But I'm also thinking of it as a little bit of a Raid Redemption movie. If you haven't seen that movie it's this really awesome Indonesian film. It's basically Batman Assault on Arkham with way more action, way less talking. If you've never seen Dirty Dozen, it, it's like this Charles Bronson World War II movie where, you know, prior to D-Day, this group of people has to come together, this group of convicts has to team up to take down a bunch of high-ranking Nazis in this suicide mission. That was from 1967. The version of Suicide Squad as we know it now, you know, created by John Ostrander, started in 1987. So you, you could say that he drew a lot of inspiration from the Dirty Dozen. Because I haven't done a whole lot of Suicide Squad videos, just to get you guys pumped up for the movie, to get you prepped, here are my top five stories that I think you should check out first. Starting with number five, Batman Assault on Arkham, the animated movie. This might be a Batman story, but really it's a Suicide Squad story with Batman in it. They just put Batman's name on the movie so that it would sell more copies. Most of the focus of the film is the Suicide Squad itself. Since it's an animated movie for a younger audience, you know I think it has a lot of silly humor in it that we won't see in the Suicide Squad movie. The tone of that will be closer to what Zack Snyder's going for in Batman v Superman and the, the Justice League franchise that he's spinning out. There will be humor. I mean, it'll still be a funny film, but it'll be a little more tongue in cheek. On to number four, The Raid Redemption. Basically, like the best example of what an action film should be with like all the fat, all the excess boiled out. The really good thing about this film is that you've probably never heard of any of these actors before. So there's no weird meta stuff going on that takes you out of the story. A SWAT team is trying to take down a drug lord who's on the top floor of a building that he's turned into his personal fortress. The challenges they face as they fight their way to the top floor like on each of the floors becomes progressively more difficult. The fighting style itself is pretty badass. Think of you know a cross between like classic John Woo and the kind of parkour stuff you saw in Captain America Winter Soldier. The story is told from the perspective of a rookie character on his first day on the job. You don't even need the subtitles to enjoy it. It's just the perfect example of how you pace an action movie that's not trying to be another type of movie. It's not trying to be some gripping drama. It's a badass action film, plain and simple. On to number three, Batman Mad Love. Basically the origin story of Harley Quinn. So Mad Love is actually by Paul Dini and Bruce Timm. You know, two people from Batman the Animated Series, which is, you know, my personal favorite Batman TV show of all time. I don't know if it's ever going to be topped. They go deep on Harleen Quinzel, you know, one time promising psychiatrist who just, you know, fell madly in love with her patient and went on to become the Joker's greatest sidekick. It does a good job of having fun with that, while at the same time showing you just how tragic her life has been and how she can, she can totally step out from the Joker's shadow if given the opportunity. It's easy to understand how some people think that she's just a backup to the Joker, but in her own right, she's an amazing character. I feel like whenever Margot Robbie was cast as Harley Quinn, this is probably the story they gave her to read so that she could learn about Harley's character. On to number two, basically all of Gail Simone's run on Secret Six. That started with the Villains United story arc and went all the way up to the New 52. She really explored what's going on in, in Deadshot's headspace. Will Smith, you know, probably going to be the biggest star in Suicide Squad next to Ben Affleck if he truly is in the film and it's not just like a Batman suit cameo with someone else inside it. I don't think the entire film is just going to focus on his character. But given that Tom Hardy dropped out and the film was originally centered on Rick Flagg, they, they might have changed some things up. And finally, my number one prep story, Suicide Squad from the Ashes by John Ostrander himself. This is a story written by the Suicide Squad creator, like the, the person who wrote the best Suicide Squad stories, that invokes a lot of the classic Suicide Squad canon while telling a modern day story. It's really about all these bad characters, these Suicide Squad characters, picking themselves up after getting their asses handed to them. Amanda Waller had been kicked out of Checkmate. Rick Flagg Jr. just barely survived this nuclear blast, almost got his face melted off. So he uses this very Arrow-type storytelling device where he flashes back to Rick Flagg Jr.'s past. So Ostrander uses Rick Flagg to do the flashbacks in the present day. He's like the connective tissue, that character. 
But like I said, that was supposed to be Tom Hardy in the film. He dropped out, was replaced by Joel Kinnaman, who played Robocop, if you guys haven't seen that movie. Will Smith was cast, so him being the bigger actor, I think that they might shift the film and do flashbacks using Will Smith's character, using the Deadshot character. We saw him on set in like pimpalicious clothing, so either Deadshot just dresses like a pimp all the time, or he's going to be the connective tissue of the film. Arguably, that should be Harley Quinn's relationship with the Joker. Really, I think the connective tissue in any Suicide Squad story would be Harley Quinn's relationship with the Joker. Just That's just way more interesting than any of the other Suicide Squad characters. I think a lot of that will be in there because it seems like most of the film is going to be them chasing the Joker down. But you could look at the fact that Margot Robbie, you know, playing Harley Quinn, and Will Smith just did a movie together called Focus where they did have a lot of chemistry together. So you can see how they might use Deadshot in a Harley Quinn Joker storyline within this movie. They kind of did that during Batman Assault on Arkham, which, which is why I keep going back to that story. Part of me feels like a bunch of executives watched that animated film after it was done and saw that people loved it so much, and they thought, hey, why don't we make a live-action version of this? Here's my big question for you, though. You know, given all the things we've seen from the set, which character are you most excited to see? I mean, there, there are a lot of characters in the film. As cool as Harley Quinn is, and as, as curious as I am about Jared Leto's Joker, I am most excited to see Cara Delevingne's Enchantress. Seriously, this movie isn't shying away from metahumans. We have Killer Croc. As long as he doesn't look like one of the Koopas, you know, from the Super Mario Brothers old movie, I think we'll be fine. King Shark is also going to be a lot of fun too. David Ayer keeps reiterating how much he wants to do this live action. They will need to use a little bit of CG touch-up, but most of this is actually going to be practical effects. That's actually why we've gotten so many pictures of, of the Batman chasing Joker around on the street, because they're not filming it on a green screen studio. So there's actually quite a bit to be excited about in this film. As cool as the action is, you know, and as much as I want them to do like a DC Raid Redemption movie, this film would be made or broken on the strength of its characters. I feel like they have enough diversity of really good actors that the film won't live or die on the strength of Jared Leto's Joker performance, but he's definitely a big part of the equation. Every superhero film is only as great as its villain, and in a film where the villains are the heroes, Jared Leto's Joker is the closest thing we actually have to a villain. I suppose who you think the villain is depends on which character you identify with the most. Since it's Wednesday, my next video is going to be my top 10 episodes from Arrow Season 3, so be sure to subscribe to get that. I, sh I should have that up by late tonight. But if there's any Suicide Squad videos you guys want me to do next, just leave requests in the comments. Just in case you guys haven't seen it yet, you can click here for my top 10 episodes of The Flash this season, and you can click here for my Flash Season 2 promo video. There's like a small promo and my predictions. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Let's high five. I'll see you guys tonight.